the champion in 2001, and until two years ago, I didn't realize this, but he had the most hits in the 1990. Yeah. 13 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was told that the Hall of Fame gets people from their generation, from the best players. Well, how can you go 10 years and have the most hits in the 90s and not be in the Hall of Fame? And maybe I'm a Cubs fan, and that's why I'm saying that, but I still, I, just, I don't understand. Don't touch it. Anyway, he won the World Series in 2001 when we introduced Mark Grace. <laughs> First time here. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome, even to, from the Cardinal fans. Thank you very much. Uh, it, this is this is such a cool place in in the state because there's there, you know the, the central part of the state is so divided between Cubs and Cardinals. And, oh yeah. And I remember as a as a player in Wrigley, the the buses would come up from St. Louis full of the Cardinal fans. And it would just be, you know, yeah, I'll go Cardinals, let's go Cardinals, let's go Cubbies, and da, da. And then, you know, it's a big rival. But then after the games were over, all the establishments around Wrigley Field, there you'd see people dressed in blue and people dressed in red, and they were just yeah. uh, toasting beers to each other. Hey, yeah. you guys beat us good today. Or, hey, you guys beat yeah. us good today. And it was, it was rarely violent. <laughs> rarely. <laughs> well, although I did see Ted on a video but I just want to thank everybody for the warm welcome and I look forward to hearing from you well you know I'm like Mark this is my first trip to Beardsley but Cardinal Caravan I've been through Many, many times, just like Beardsley, uh, throughout my lifetime. And, um, you know, I came originally from Detroit, Michigan, moved to St. Louis, and have been there ever since I first came to the Cardinals, and I've stayed. Um, and as I say, there are eight okay. states that are contiguous to Missouri, obviously Illinois being one of them. Um, but Mark touched upon the real special aspect of this part of the world is that it is, you know, family, cub, cardinal rivalry. I mean, brothers against brothers, sisters yeah. against oh, yeah. mothers, yeah. Like <laughs> grandfathers <laughs> against granddaughters. It's like that. It's true. And it's, uh, it's just the way it is around here. And I don't care if it's this part of Illinois or another part of Arkansas or another part of Kentucky or Tennessee or, you know, Iowa, 
it's like that everywhere, but nothing, nothing quite as avid split than here around this area from Peoria yep. to you name it. And I mean, I've been, as I say, to many places very, very much like Beardston. And I mean, it's down to which tavern you go to. <laughs> <laughs> There's a so, lot done here. <laughs> right. So I just like to, you know, along with Mark, to tell you, I've been to the, your town many times, named differently, but people, names and faces, uh, very much the same. And I enjoy this part of the world. As I say, I came from Detroit, moved to St. Louis, and actually thought I'd move to the tropics when I got down there, <laughs> Michigan and the Detroit area. But you, you, you people here are around, uh, accustomed to the snow and the ice and the um, cold weather and that sort of stuff. And I grew up in it. And when I went to St. Louis, I thought I'd move to Miami Beach. <laughs> um, I'm glad to see that uh, Tom uh, made it here today. He had some difficulty coming from St. Louis last night and ended up in the ditch. So you people make sure you're good and careful going home because it's still treacherous out there. And i um, glad he made it and I hope you all make it safe too. But uh, thanks for coming here today. I suspect there's some questions out there that you might want to ask uh, each one of us, and you're at at, uh, uh, at your own pace. If you'd That's like why to we're here. Question. We're here to answer whatever you'd like to hear. For both of you, Mark, the toughest pitcher you personally had to face, and Ted, the best pitcher you ever caught. Oh man, there's 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 too many to uh, to say because they're. They're all major league pitchers. The, there is no higher level than the major leagues. They're, 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 those are the best pitchers and players in the world. If there was a higher league, Mike Trout would be there. Or you know, th those kind of players, there's those elite players. But I'm sorry, Ted. Um, but the best, probably the, the, the one that was toughest on me was stepping in Stepping in the batter's box from the left side against Randy Johnson. Oh, yeah. I, I think, uh, I think honestly, I'd rather be sitting in the dentist chair. Than, than, than but he was the best left-handed pitcher I ever faced. The best right-hander. Uh, probably the greatest, the greatest right-hander I ever, not necessarily the best, but the greatest was probably Nolan Ryan. He, uh, I'm about... I'm about five of those 5,000 strikeouts he has, but I, I only had to face him for, for a year. But those are, those are my two picks. The, the best pitcher I ever caught was clearly Gibson. No, no getting around that. And I'm lucky to have seen him pitch uh, at, at or near his prime still. Um, he was the greatest pitcher I ever caught. But that much better than Carlton? He was. <coughs> yeah. He was. The reason I say that, because Gibson just threw two pitches. He just That's threw two pitches. Fastball, slider. Yep. Hard, hard. He didn't throw any kind of changeup. Off, it didn't matter if it was a right-handed batter or a left-handed batter. It was fastball, slider the whole way. And I mean, when you're, as a major league hitter, you're in a position to you know, break it down to 50-50 percentage-wise, you just eliminate one mm -hmm. and set on the other until you get it. <laughs> and so to pitch throughout a, a ball game that way, when you know every batter's playing 50-50 with you, for you to survive that, and when I say to survive it, he not only survived it, this is a guy who had a 1.12 <laughs> all-time <laughs> record for ERA in Major League history. So, I mean, you're looking at somebody that is so special. I mean, I just scratched my head at that point in time in my life. And just briefly, he's the best I ever caught. The best I ever faced was Seaver. And yeah. the reason re he was the toughest that I ever faced as a hitter is I didn't have to face Gibson.
So you, you, you talked uh, about uh, catching uh, Gibson. You caught his no-hitter. Yes. So tell us about, he threw two pitches. What was it like to call that game with him on the mound? I, easy? I, oh, <laughs> yes, it's very easy. But I, this is great. I'm glad you asked this question. I'll make it short. Um, but when I first came up, I came to the majors and caught Bob the first time. I was 20 years old. And I tell people that I was so young at that time, in between innings, I was thinking more about my prom than I was <laughs> what to do out there as far as calling the games. I was so green and so unready to catch in the major leagues at the time. But Shannon got sick. Torrey got moved to third base. They called me from AAA, and no, I wasn't ready defensively. I was all right as a hitter, but I just learned my way along. But this is how it was. When I first started catching Gibson, the whole thing with Gibson was pace. He wanted to go. He didn't want to waste any time. He wanted to go. And as a kid, just I'm, you know, putting down fingers, hoping. And so after, you know, two or three innings the first time, I said, look, I just threw the fastball and the slider. Okay. On your fingers, one fastball, free slider. Got that. Okay. <laughs> okay. But he said, look, I'm coming. If I'm coming and I'm shaking, if you put down one and I'm coming and I'm shaking, you know it's the other pitch. <laughs> and when I tell you that's what was going on when I first came, Anytime he was shaking, all I had to do was remember what I'd put down, and it was the other pitch. And that's what it was like catching him. And when you say, was that easy? After he explained all this. <laughs> what was the hardest part of the game for you guys to learn from your rookie season to your last game? What was something that you guys still were working on to your last game? Was it the hitting? Was it the pitching? Or, you know, you know, like as pitchers come in, or was it the scouting, things like that? Well, oh, good question. Um, I, think for, I think I can speak for Ted, too. Most difficult thing for us was our speed. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom might go to get the second Tom, piece. Tom, Tom, <laughs> Tommy Lasorda Tom Lasorda was yelling at me from the, from the Dodger dugout one time. He said, hey, Grace. And he had a few expletives and he said, <laughs> said, hey, Grace, if you raced a pregnant lady, you'd come in third. <laughs> one of the better lines, one of the better insults I've ever received. So. That's a good one. Uh, did you get a play against the Tigers in 68 or not? No. Oh, you didn't? No, and I, I didn't. I, I was in the minors at that time. Oh, were you? But just quickly, you know, on a more serious note, it, oh, that was great line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, the hardest thing for me is, as a catcher, defensively, you're always trying to come up to speed with the opposition. Today, it's much, much more sophisticated today um, than it used to be. But we used to have charts and that sort of stuff and lined, you know, situations we had to go over. And just learning the opposition, what their best skill set was, how they should be played in the infield and outfield, that was ongoing. So <coughs> over time, you got to, you know, understand it pretty well. Um, and, you know, today, it's, it's really a very complicated thing. So if you're a catcher today, I mean, you best be at that ballpark at 2 o'clock in the afternoon today, watching video, going over, you know, the, the opposition, uh, and talking with the pitcher that's scheduled to pitch that night. It's really, really demanding today. It's like an NFL quarterback now. The data is huge, and it's... I'm glad I don't have to deal with it now. Catchers have those quarterback things on their... Yeah, they do. <laughs> they use those and everything today. Actually, like, even like the outfielders You used to do. watch a guy swing, okay? Is he tardy on this? Yeah, or right. right. <laughs> now, you're, now <laughs> yeah. It's all laid right yeah. out there. Now William McCovey's up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, the data is, is huge today. So 
Uh, much more demand today. <coughs> much more. Okay. So I have a follow up for that. Uh -huh. Is so how many people would be involved in that so far in, in advance of the wow. game? Obviously the catcher, the backup catcher, the pitching coach, there you are. starter, Correct. some of the relievers. Some of the relievers could be there too. So that um, and that, those they might be separate discussions. So mm -hmm. you might have the starter that night, um, maybe at two o'clock. You might have uh, the closer and three relievers um, for the eighth, ninth, and I mean seventh, eighth, and ninth inning. Yeah. This is who's going to be there. Here's their best pinch hitter, right hand. Yeah, here's their best pinch hitter, left hand. Yeah. Watch video, see what the guy is like. It's that demanding today. And guy, you know, if I got there, you know, at three three thirty, you know, for batting practice at four thirty. You know, when I played, two o'clock today, or they're wondering where you are. Maybe even earlier. Yeah. yeah. Where Where yeah. is he? You know, the expectation. And, and they, then they start great. questioning your dedication. Right. <laughs> no, it's exactly. true. Well, how much does he care? Yeah, right. You're right. Right. Oh, this isn't important enough for you. <laughs> well, you know, they make a little bit of money now. They do. Yeah. yeah. But they can take it all away too. True. But you know, let me say something about that too. You know, it's all relative. People have walked to me, and I'm sure they've said to you, Bob, just what if you were playing today? What if you were playing today? I have to be honest. I mean, Babe Ruth made $75,000 in 1928, okay? Yeah. Do you have any idea what that oh money would pay and buy? Then. In 1928? What would that With no be taxes today? <laughs> and all the rest. So. There's a certain amount of relativity here. And so I don't complain because I wasn't making as much as the president, maybe. But, God Almighty, I was doing far better than I was on 28705 Aberdeen, Southfield, Michigan, when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, baseball has been very, very good to me. I complain. You know, I, I don't. And I, still is. Yeah, and it's still been is great. Good. My yeah. whole life, I'm lucky. Cool. Back in the back. Hey, Mark, what kind of guy was Ryan Sandberg? What kind of guy was he? Yeah, I mean, on the field. On, on the, the field, field, he was. <laughs> he's, you know, there was Joe Morgan. There was Ryan Sandberg. There was arguments over who was the more dominant second baseman of his era. Uh, Rhino, I think, for about a maybe four, three, four, five year. Run was quite possibly the best player in baseball. Um, people forget what an unbelievably consistent defensive second baseman he was. And uh, Rhino, you know, just a just a terrific player. I hit, I, I he's a, he's a quiet guy. He's a, he's a man of few words. Um, I I hit behind him for ten years. He hit second. I hit third. And I played right next to him for 10 years. He played second, I played first. And I think I know him today like I knew him the first day I met him. You know, he's just a very quiet guy. Uh, he, he, he didn't let a whole lot of people inside his world, but I know and I thank God for him because I think I know for a fact that he made me a better player by being on base for me, by being a Gold Glove second baseman next to me, I could. Uh, I, you, when you play with somebody that long, you you know where they are without without even looking over there. Or you know, we used to put on our own hit and runs. Like like Don Zimmer would, you know, if Rhino went to the top of you know covered the logo on his on his Cubs helmet, that was a hit and run. And we'd do it, and Don Zimmer would, what the hell are you guys doing out here? <laughs> <laughs> that was a hit and run, Skipper. It worked out pretty good. <laughs> so, you thought you were asleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a two-part question for both of you, but um, who was the best teammate that each of you guys had? And then the second part is we seem to have a lot of young men and women in here that are just starting their baseball or softball journey. What do you guys think makes a great teammate? Really good question. Best teammate I ever had, I think, was Peter Vukovic, and stayed probably my best friend throughout my life. Um, P. 
Peter, um, he's the ideal teammate because number one, he's got your back all the time. Doesn't care what situation you find yourself in, good, bad, or indifferent, should have gotten into this situation or shouldn't, he's got your back. And it's kind of the single best thing you can have for a teammate. Sometimes you're out there a little bit out over your skis. And that teammate reach out and grab you and yank you back. Say, hey, pal, you're out over a little too far. And not only are you putting yourself in jeopardy, you're putting uh, us all in jeopardy. So the best teammate reach out and grab you and yank you back. Or the best teammate will see, hey, you're riding a little low right now, pal. And that may be good for you, but that's not good for the rest of us. And that guy will grab you and push you forward. And I found that Peter Vukovic was that kind of person. <clears throat> no matter where you were, he was always there at your back to give you the lift or pull you back when you thought you needed it. And I don't care if you're male or female, softball, hardball, um, little league, major league. That's the best kind of teammate for me. And three names come to mind for me with the, with the Cubs. Early in my career, I played with about three years with Rick Sutcliffe, uh, a, you know, former Cy Young Award winner. And he was, you know, I was, barely 22 years old when I got to the big leagues, so I you know, thought I had all the answers. Obviously, I didn't. And uh, like you said, uh, I was not so gently pulled back by Rick Sutcliffe. Uh, but, but also, he, he, he taught me so much about, I, lear I learned a lot more about, about hitting, talking to pitchers. Then, you know, I, I wanted to pick their brain and find out what they're what they're trying to do to get you out. And that, so, so Sut taught me a lot of stuff about the game. But he also he also reminded me, like uh, you know, to, like like he said, you know, it's like he's got your back. If you if you do something, you know, if you if if you act stupid on the field and you and you upset the other team, you know, like he would have been the first guy to. To, to let you know that that's not the way we do things here. Uh, so, so I'll always remember that. As my career went on, one of my favorite people that I've ever met in my life was, uh, was a shortstop named Sean Dunstan. And Sean was from the streets of Brooklyn, and I'm from the streets of Bentonville, Arkansas. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's no similarities, so. Uh, but he liked me because I could pick his throws out of the dirt. So and that, and that was and that was about the only reason he liked me for, for a little while. But then, but then uh, as we got to as we got to know each other and got to trust each other, he became one of my favorite people. To this day, we still keep in contact. Uh, heck, he won three World Series. He's a coach now with the San Francisco Giants, uh, and I just I, I thank God for Sean. And then uh, another guy that I, towards the end of my Cub career, was uh, a, a guy from a his father was a famous baseball player, Hal McRae, uh, Brian McRae. His son was also one of my favorite teammates that that I ever had for a lot of the same reasons that that. that that Ted listed. So those three guys come to mind. Do you guys do you guys think the baseballs are different now? Yes. They're they're top flights. Yeah. <laughs> 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 If, if anybody if anybody tells you that the ball is is not juiced, I'm sorry they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yep. blatant. Yep. It's blatant. Really? We have this guy. Baseball's been very good, you guys, as you said. Better day. 
outside of baseball, what gets you two out of bed and gets you excited every day now? I got two teenage boys. I'm just glad I don't have teenage girls. <laughs> I like that. I had two um, sons that are a far cry from teenagers anymore. Um, well, you know, I'm still involved with professional baseball. I'm employed by the Atlanta Braves, and I. My assignment is I have the National League, so I cover um, every player in the National League and write a full report and ship that off to their database in Atlanta. Hmm. And the box scores still get me up, MLB Network, and during the off season, and then, of course, during the season, that's just full bore. So I've been a lifer in this industry my whole life, and. Um, anybody who's been in it and wants out of it, out of their mind, trust me. <laughs> I'll stay as long as I have a question for Mark. You mentioned Don Zimmer a while ago, and he's one of my favorite pitchers in baseball. I miss him every day. How, how, was, he, how was he on a day-to-day -day basis while he was in Chicago? Zim? <laughs> well... It, it depended on how the horses were running out of sportsmen's park. <laughs> if, if they were running good, oh man, he was the happiest dude in the world. If they weren't running so good, he got a little grounded. <laughs> but, but Zim, Zim was, uh, was, you know, you hear this term all the time, old school. He was, he was a guy that. Uh, he, he was he was tough on young players and really leaned on his veteran players like most of that era uh, of managers did. Um, Zim went to the, the very first the very first day I got called to the big leagues. I, we're in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm playing Triple A for Des Moines, and I get the call that I'm going to the big leagues. The team is in San Diego. Good luck getting a direct flight from Des Moines to San Diego. <laughs> so you've got a better chance of going straight to Beardstown to San Diego. So, um, so I got to fly, I got to fly to Chicago. So I'm flying East to catch another flight to go all the way to the West coast. And I, you know, it takes a little time. So I get there, we got a seven o'clock game in San Diego. I get there at about four 30 and I get my bags and get to the ballpark. Now it's about, a little after 5.30, you know, it takes a little while. Game's at 7. I'm in the lineup. <laughs> I'm in the lineup hitting 6th or 7th, whatever it was. So I get there, and famous, our famous clubhouse man for decades there, a guy named Yosh Kawano, he, uh, he's like, the man wants to see you. And I'm like, okay, where's the man's office? You know, I've never, never had a day in the big leagues. Zim calls me in. I said, I said, Zim, you wanted to see me? He said, shut the door. I said, okay. He says, you're my first baseman. That's great. <laughs> and then he says, until you show me you're not my first baseman. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And he says, this is what he says. He says, we'll know in about a week. Nice. A week? Nice. I got one week? Man, nothing like a good long look. So so I, I said, I better get hot. You know, if, I, if, if, if I'm going to stay up here, I better get hot. And uh, I think that was the best thing. He, you know, that those old uh, prison shows, Scared Straight. That, that old son of a gun scared me straight. And I, and, I, and I got off to a good start and stayed there. So I was very fortunate. Yes, ma'am. As a lifelong fan of yours, Ted, I was heartbroken when you got traded, and still to this day, I hate why you were gone. <laughs> well, you've got to get over this hate. <laughs> there are people you can talk to about it. <laughs> Did you hate uh, Keith Hernandez for Neil Allen, too? Yeah. <laughs> yes. No doubt. Yes. 
you know, that, that whole business, um, you know, people often ask me about it. And I said, you know, well, you know, especially the Cardinal fans in St. Louis, they say, well, you know, I remember when you got traded, Teddy, to Milwaukee, and I remember, you know, when, you know, the Cardinals beat the pants off you in the World Series in 1982. <laughs> and I all turned to them, and I said, you know, now I know this is going to shock you when I say this, but I've gotten over it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have, and I mean, this gray hair signifies a certain age to some extent. And 1982 was... If you stop and do the math, quite a while ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> hatred, you've got to let go of, all right? And um, I certainly have. And um, you know, that thing worked out as best it could. And the St. Louis Cardinal people are happy as heck as they still be because of it. But my move to Milwaukee was really the single best thing that ever happened to my career, and I'll tell you why. Um, I stayed in St. Louis and still lived there, so I didn't really leave the community. My kids went to school there, grew up there, and it's, it became my home. Um, so what moving to Saint, uh, from St. Louis to Milwaukee did for me was, for the first time, showed me just how large this industry was. I used to think it was a little provincial little mm -hmm. place in St. Louis, and it was the only place I'd ever be or go in my life. And I realized how big the major leagues were. And I saw, wow, there's 30 of these teams out here. And I ended up in Seattle, uh, San Diego, Atlanta, St. Louis, Milwaukee, Pittsburgh. And, you know, the St. Louis Cardinal family is really <coughs> wonderful and big-time family. But this industry is one giant family. And that trade, if you were, Whitey were here right now, I'd say, Whitey, you may not believe this, <laughs> but I'd say, it's the best thing that happened to me. And so that's how I view it. Now get over that hate. <laughs> Damn it, girl. And you got Vukovic to go with you, though. Yeah, Our best friend. And Finger. Yeah. And Finger. Yeah. So it's the best thing that happened to me in my whole career. Opened everything up. And I played in the seventh game of the World Series. You know. I remember watching that World Series, Ted, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember who the pitcher was, but it was in St. Louis. It was one of the games in St. Louis. And I remember you hit this long, long fly ball that went about two feet foul. Nah. And then the very next pitch, yeah. you hit the, a longer, <laughs> even further, fair home run. Yeah. If I ever hit a foul home run, that was it. I might as well just drop my back, <laughs> put my helmet down. Go, you think that was something? Wait till you see how far I hit this next one. And I've been just, I'm going to, I'm guaranteed I'm going to strike out. How the hell did you do that? <laughs> First of all, I didn't do it. Actually, the foul ball you, you're talking about, I did that. Okay? But. Force is one through the next pitch. He's the one that did. <laughs> Play that ball right up here in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. <laughs> That's hard to do. But a dumb pitcher, you're right. <laughs> Force through the pitch, right? He's the one that did. Speaking about Bob Force, I saw him. It seemed like every time I went down there, he was. You were in the lineup, and he was pitching, which was great. And he was, he was an interesting guy. Uh, talk a little bit about him. And one of my other f guys that you played with that I had a lot of uh, interest in and fun to watch was Silent George. And I'd like to know a little bit about him as a teammate. Well, Forrest was a great human being, a wonderful guy. Came from Sacramento, California. His brother was also a major league pitcher with Houston. And they were, I mean, same two guys, quiet, <coughs> easygoing, Nothing could uh, shake them and love the, the one vice they had. They loved to drink beer, and that's not a vice. They, if you could sit down in a room like this with a six pack, I mean, five minutes you'd love him. He was just the easiest guy to like and be around on the face of the earth. 
No. He threw two no hitters today. Yeah, he threw two. Did you I, catch caught, him? I caught one of those, and uh, I think the other one was with Porter when uh, Porter came to St. Louis mm -hmm. after I was traded. And um, I mean, really, really talented guy. The thing that made Force so special is he had a sinking fastball that, I mean, didn't matter who was up, you couldn't lift it. Mm -hmm. Because that ball coming late and sink like that, and it was, he was just a ground ball machine. <laughs> and so you knew what you were going to get. You're going to throw you that sinker, but if you tried to lift it or tried to pull it, you were going to hit a ground ball and you're going to be out. Um, the other guy you talked about was Easy George. Um, George I got to know really well. Played with him for five years, I think it was, in St. Louis. And he hit the... Uh, fourth and I hit fifth when he came over and really a needed guy for us. Outstanding um, defensive player, could run, had outstanding power and came with a reputation that to some extent was deserved because George was just antisocial. Not because he disliked people, he just disliked people who were always asking are always wanting some from him, particularly the media. And so he got to the point where he wouldn't talk to them at all because when he was in Cleveland, Cleveland was a terrible club. He was the best player on that team. And every night, the media would come to George. What's the matter with your team? How come you didn't hit two homers tonight if he hit one? How come you didn't get three hits if you got two? And he finally said, that's it. And playing in Cleveland those days was just the worst place you could be. It would be the worst place to get traded to, the worst place to go. Cold in September, cold in, I mean, April, in just of nobody. Nobody there. <laughs> in a giant stadium that held 77,000 people, <laughs> and they couldn't get 7,700. Okay, so it's just a miserable place. He went from there to San Diego, and... Um, did okay there and then brought him here to St. Louis. And when he got here, I mean, he played. Didn't deal with the media. Still wouldn't. And I'll give him one credit. He didn't matter where he went, back and forth. He just was anti media and wouldn't talk to any of them. He even said, I remember this the night. We were in the clubhouse and uh, Jeff Buck was in there and Red was there and I overheard him say it. And George had just come, he had just come to St. Louis, and George, um, Jack said to Red, he said, I'll get him to talk, he'll talk to me, I'll show you. <laughs> and, you know, Jack Buck, if you ever gonna get it done, he's gonna be Jack Buck. <laughs> yeah. okay. And so, we waited, pre-game show, he'll go on my pre-game show, which Jack did every night. <coughs> he walked right up to George, uh, to George Hendrick, Jack Buck, he says, I want you on my pregame show. Um, I need you out there in 15 minutes. He says, I'm sorry, Mr. Buck, I'm, I'm not going to do it. He says, no, I, you, ha you know, I really want you to do that. This is the first night you're here. I want to talk to you be pregame. He says, I'm sorry, Mr. Buck, I'm not doing it. He didn't. And he's the only person I've ever seen defy Jack Buck in my life. <laughs> I never do. Nobody in their right mind would. You talk about a double-edged sword. I mean, this guy is sharp on both sides, man. He can cut you this way and get you that way, too. So, it's pretty rough. Okay. Uh, speaking of Jack Buck, uh, I wonder, Mr. Race, if you have any good stories about Harry Carey. And oh, if you man. have any, <laughs> Mr. Simmons, if you have any good stories about Bob Uecker. <laughs> yeah. um, I was very like 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 Ted was saying the double-edged sword. Harry had that as well. And I was very lucky. Uh, Harry liked me because I played in Peoria, Illinois, and his best friend Pete Menachem owned the Peoria Chiefs. So so I played very well for for Peoria. So Pete Menachem would always tell Harry about. You know, this snot-nosed kid down in Peoria doing well playing first base. So, you know, he, Harry, Harry would, I'd be in double-A ball and somebody would say, Harry Carey mentioned you on the, on the, you know, on the Cubs broadcast. And get him up here, you know. All that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm in Pittsfield, Massachusetts playing in double-A ball. And I'm like, hey, great. And then 
Anyway, but Harry, I was, I was lucky. Harry liked me. Because if Harry did not like you, your ass was gone in about a week. <laughs> and he would, he, would, he would just crucify you to the point where the, it would create fan outrage. You know, yeah, get Candy Maldonado out of here, you know. And, you know, and, and within two days, Candy Maldonado was, uh, was yeah. looking for work. So, so Harry had that, he, you know, and Harry's an icon. Uh, there will never be another, um, and, and I don't want there ever to be another, to be honest with you. But my one of my one of my fun stories with uh, with, with Harry is well, <laughs> here we go. Uh, <laughs> one time you hear this. Playing that. I think they're playing the Cardinals. And Harry always got fired up when the Cubs were playing the Cardinals because of his Cardinal days and then now his Cub days. So, so he would always get fired up. And this is back when when you could have a frosty cold one or five up in the booth. And, and Harry and Steve, Harry and Steve Stone are doing the game, and the 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 Cubs are doing something exciting. And you know, Harry, and you always have to read these in. Cub fans, this Bud's for you, you know. And then he goes, well, I don't know about you Cub fans, but this Bud's for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you hear this, <laughs> and then it goes silent for about five seconds, and then you hear this, <laughs> <laughs> and Steve Stone says, boy, those sound graphics are really working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can you, can you imagine being able to do that this day and age? You know, you'd be thrown off the air immediately. And, uh, and but Harry would never, you know, never. So, uh, so that was one. Of, that was one of my favorites. Well, one one other time, Harry was talking about telling Steve about. I guess Harry had never had a seedless grape before. <laughs> yeah, just about every green grape is a seedless grape. You know, so. So he's talking about, you know, it must, we must have been getting our butts kicked because they're talking about seedless grapes on here. So, so anyway, hey, Steve, I, I had these things. like I didn't know they had seedless grapes. How, how the hell do they have seedless grapes? And, and Steve says something to the effect about, well, genetically, you know, they, 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 he goes, genetic? I thought that was about sex. <laughs> <laughs> and they just moved on. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think I'm going to say anything after that, now you're wrong. <laughs> I will tell you that Euchre may be the funniest man I've ever lived. Ever. Maybe ever. But I'm not saying anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> God, that was great. So, Mark. Who does the best Harry Carey impression of all the Cubs that you played with? Of all the Cubs that yeah. I played with? Somebody you I mean, I, guess, I didn't play with Dempster, but I guess Dempster did a, did a, did a good one. I, I really... We, we everybody, too, everybody does one. We were all too, <laughs> we were all too afraid to do Harry impressions because yeah. we didn't get one to show at the door. You know? so we, we kissed his butt. Yeah. Will Ferrell's pretty good. If you're yeah. right. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Ted, Ted, what do you what do you think of Yachty? Yachty is the best defender I've ever seen at the position. People have asked me this, and they often ask me, you know, and I've gotten I used to it. it. But, you know, he's waned to some extent here in the last three or four years. Yeah. He's caught so much, mm -hmm. and he's really so tired. Mm -hmm. He's gone to one knee pretty much, and he doesn't shift or block like he used to. But nobody steals or hit and runs anyway today, so it's, it's not True. that big a deal. But I tell people this, and this is sincerely how I feel about it. There's no catcher I've ever, ever watched in my life. And I go... Back to Barra as a kid, yeah. freehand, batty, yeah. all those guys in the old, old school, okay? I've seen them all. But people ask me this question, and I tell them, Yachty could be the pitching coach. Yeah. He could be the hitting coach. Mm -hmm. He could be the manager. Yeah. He could be the catcher. Yeah. 
all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how strong this guy is. Yeah. When he goes to the mound, calls timeout, mm -hmm. he goes out there because he has something to say to that pitcher mm -hmm. that probably is far and away more than what any pitching coach or manager could go out and say. Yeah. He literally stops the game because he's decided in one form or another, this game needs him right now. And I mean, I see him do stuff that I don't want to sound like a dope, but <coughs> I've seen catching my whole life. And I was a catcher my whole life. And I did things that I thought were pretty subtle and pretty cool sometimes, but there was no one to tell, okay? <laughs> but when I look at him and I see him do things, I say to myself, I haven't seen that even tried, okay, in 20 years. Yeah. He is far and away, far and away. If he doesn't manage when he's done playing, it'd be criminal. You think he'll make what you did? Pardon me? You think he'll make what you did? The whole I time? do, yeah. defensively. Yeah. He's, he's, he belongs well, He's the best there. of his ear, that's for sure. There's no question. And he's become a really dangerous hitter, <laughs> yeah. clutch hitter. He gets a lot of clutch hits. That's he right. absolutely does. So he, he um, struggled early, and then he's taught himself how to hit. So He's really durable, and speaking yes. of that, so are you. Uh, that's one of your career's highlights. There's got to be how many games you caught and for how many years, but especially in Bush Stadium, too, which was too. not a <laughs> friendly place to play. Talk a little bit about well, well, congratulations, first of all, on being that durable and, and how that got you into the Hall of Fame, I think, just it, because it, you were Yeah, it, it, the, the durability is part of the mix, okay. But I have to, uh, you know, um, um, what's the word? I have to uh, say, okay, everyone talks to me about the heat and the astroturf. First thing, the heat in St. Louis and the humidity is, is awful. We all know that. Okay. But for me, as the catcher, yeah, I was dirt. in the dirt. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't have to stand out there like Brock. I didn't have to, you know, stand out there, you know, as the others. I mean, the, remember the metal cleats, okay, oh, yeah. on everybody's feet? Burn you. Uh, you stand, it had, an, it had an asphalt base with a little foam maybe an inch or two, and then the astroturf, and those cleats would go right down to the base of that mm -hmm. asphalt, yeah. and it would literally blister in the shape of those cleats where your feet were pressing down on those cleats. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they went to the tartan, mm -hmm. rubber-soled shoes, because <coughs> that wouldn't conduct the heat, and guys would line their shoes with uh, tin foil after every inning, run, put their feet right in a bucket of, of ice water. And they'd, be dry, and they'd be dry so 30 they seconds came, after you bring, yeah. bring them out. Yeah, so, I mean, I was lucky I was, at least had the dirt, but the heat and humidity in Cincinnati, Atlanta, Houston, St. Louis, Philly. it just, Philadelphia, it'll kill you. You know, and that's why today you don't see many guys like Ozzy, or nobody catches, you know, like I used to, 150 games, how many mm -hmm. times in a row. They don't even want that guy anymore. True. The sabermetrics people, split it, go for the platoon effect, get us a right-handed hit and catcher and a left-handed hit and catcher, and they'll both be more fresh. So that's the way it's even played today. They don't want a guy like that anymore. Do you think you were better right-handed or left-handed? Natural left, switched right. By the time I was nine years old in little league programs, I was doing it all the time. Yeah. So I had a long, long time to get proficient. And it took to me about till 24, where I was mature physically, where I felt right-handed was every bit as good as left, mm -hmm. and I didn't care anymore. To follow up that, and really, a lot of kids grow up thinking they want to be a professional baseball player. Did you guys? Think that when you were younger, and then what was the break that got you to where you got to now? Um, I think I think growing up when you're in your elementary years, uh, growing up in Tennessee and Arkansas, I was a I was a Cardinals fan because KMOX would just 
blow <laughs> as far as they could blow it. So me and my brother would go to bed. Me and my brother would go to bed listening to Jack Buck and Mike Shannon doing, you know, Ted Simmons and the Cardinals. And I, I grew up a enormous Cardinal fan, end up getting drafted by the Cubs, you know, the team, the team I grew up despising. But, but I changed my allegiance, quick, allegiance quickly. But, yeah, I remember playing wiffle ball with my buddies or playing tennis ball in the backyard with my buddies, you know. We would try to do batting stances, you know, and, and one of our friends would be Ted Simmons and the other one of our, one of our friends would be Lou Brock with the close stance and then the... You know, and this guy, this guy over here, he wanted to be Jack Clark, or this guy over here, he wanted to, he wanted to be Ozzy. You know, it was it was just that way, and so you always had dreams of, of being a major league baseball player, but I don't, you know, I don't I don't know how good a player you were when you were high school, but I also <clears throat> lived in reality. I was just I was just an okay ba baseball player when I was like in high school. I I was a late bloomer, so. So yes, I dreamed about playing in the major leagues, but I also had reality that uh, you know less than two percent of all young men that get drafted actually make it to the big leagues for even one day. Yeah. So, needless to say, Ted and I were very fortunate to to be able to not only play in the big leagues, but to you know 16 years for myself. I'm not sure how many years for you. So, just incredibly lucky and fortunate, but but also. There was a lot of talent here, and I wasn't I wasn't too bad myself. <laughs> Did you guys line your knuckles up? That was an old strategy. Yeah, yes. um, yeah, I, I, I did. I, I yeah, did. right here. I mean, the two yeah, ones. I did. Yeah, <coughs> the the object was to get the the bat handle in your fingers, mm -hmm. which was the longest leverage point. Mm -hmm. So, in your fingers, you get the most leverage back in your hand or in your palm, it gets stiff. So that's the, the reason why the fingers that way was, was important. I grew up wanting to be Al Kaline. And from the time I was seven, eight, nine years old, that's who I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. The thing that he's touched upon was reality for me, is I had people telling me in the Detroit area, by the time I was 13, 14 years old, you're a major, major league hitter. And I always asked the same question. I was a bit of a creep at 14 years old because I was bulletproof and doing all this athletic stuff, football, basketball, baseball. You know, I thought I was pretty hot stuff. And everybody was saying to me, you're going to be a major league hitter. How the hell did he know? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's really nice of you to say, but none of these people had ever played in the major league. So I said, how the heck does he know? Okay, you know, I kind of, maybe my own way of keeping myself grounded. I don't know. Instead of getting too, you know, out of my head. But Joe Cunningham was the first guy. He was my manager in Modesto, California, at the Fast A level. He came to me and he says, "You look like a major league hitter to me. I think you're going to be a major league hitter." The first time I stopped and said, "You know, this might happen," and I was. 19 years old by now, or 18 years old. It was the first time I'd ever heard anybody say to me that I was going to be a major league hitter who had actually been one. And I said, yeah. now I started believing it. It's kind of cool to hear. Yeah, yeah. I started believing it. The rest of them, I just, give me a break, man. What the heck do you know? <laughs> That's the way I thought when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. You know, I had trouble with my dad, too, you know? <laughs> Tim, Tim <laughs> like everybody 15, 16, 17 years old. Cardinal fan. Hey, um, Mark talked about a funny instance with uh, Tommy Lasorda. Did you guys have a rivalry team? Uh, and yell at him, what was the funniest thing that you ever heard? <laughs> uh, did, well, like, like, like somebody, somebody, somebody bench jockeying you. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the, best, the best bench jockeys, okay, the best bench jockeys or Neyland I ever got was in Chicago's Wrigley Field, okay, standing in that on deck circle, okay, with the Cub fans right there, and I mean right there. I heard stuff as a 
an 18, 19 year old, I don't think I'd ever heard before. <laughs> it told me, no matter what, man, don't turn around, don't look at him, don't, don't say around. one word. <laughs> and until you're standing that on deck as an opposing player, in Richard Field, oh, you have heard nothing. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best lines I got from a, from a fan that was not, you know, with F words and, you know, hey, Grace, you suck. <laughs> so, so one, one, of the, one of the wittiest lines I ever heard was in, in Philadelphia, hey, Grace, what's your last name? <laughs> Usually you don't acknowledge, but I just went, that was good. <laughs> that was very nice. That was very nice. Okay. Uh, what was the nicest thing Bob Gibson ever said to you when you had to go to the mound? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> you don't know nothing about pitching. Get out of here. That's the nicest thing he ever said. He actually said that to me. He actually did. He said it to McCarver before me, too. Because Timmy had said that to me. And sure enough, I went out there years later, man, he said, Get out of here. You don't know nothing about pitching. Back there and put the finger. What was your, uh, I'm sorry. What was your uh, favorite, as an opposing player, favorite place to play at or a city club? Oh, man, St. Louis was great. Uh, the, the, the Cardinal fans make make the visiting experience for, for a visiting team make it special because they're, I mean, Cub fans are special. Cardinal fans are in a in a in a much much smaller city, much smaller city. Their their following is is, is just unmatched. Uh, you know, like, like there's millions more people in Chicago to go to to go to Wrigley Field. So. Uh, so, so St. Louis was always a great place as a Cub to go, to go play just because, you know, they're, they're, the, the stadium was rocking, you know. Um, I, I, liked, I liked playing uh, in Atlanta. Uh, early in my career, they had uh, County Stadium, the ball really flew. And then they went to Turner Field, which was a bigger park, and the ball didn't fly there as much because they had – Smoltz, Glavin, Matt. <laughs> so, so, so the ball didn't quite fly as much at Turner Field. Um, I always felt like for some reason I had success in Philadelphia and uh, in that stadium, the the vet. Um, but I mean, they're they're all they're they're now now these gosh these new ballparks are just unbelievable. You know they're they're unbelievable. Like Target Field in Minnesota is amazing. Just just if, if you go, if you're all as big of baseball fans as as I think you are, take a summer and get in an RV or get, and, and go to go to five or six of these new ballparks, man. You'll just be you'll be in awe of of what's out there. And if you're a fan of the game, you just you'll love it. You'll you'll love what's out there. It's uh it's 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 a it's cool. It really is. What I say quickly is that, I mean, not because he's here or not because there's half the place is full of Cub fans, but I liked Wrigley the best and it was related to where I grew up and watched baseball in Detroit. Detroit was Briggs Stadium when I was a kid and Tiger Stadium, which they ultimately or eventually tore down a few years back. But when I went to Wrigley, it was like being at home growing up where I did. The summers are the same, same cool breeze going in the wind, I mean, in the summertime. It was just like playing at home. And my friends would all come from Detroit because it was only a five hour drive. And I'd see people I you know, knew and grew up with. And it, it was really special that way. But you know, I got to really like those parks. And when I went to the American League, when Milwaukee was over there, um, Boston for the same reason. And I can go far enough back where, I mean, and I'm not ashamed to say it, or hesitant to say it, Connie Mack, 
Pittsburgh, you know, all these places had all the old places, and I loved going in them because the, the nostalgia was everywhere. You'd go in there and walk through the clubhouse, and they didn't have all the old pictures on. You might see, you know, um, Hannes Wagner photograph right there on the way to the clubhouse, and it would have been a, 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 an original one. And so it was, it was like that. And so Wrigley was very special for me because it was one of the old parks. Yes, sir. Now, I know, I know you mentioned your speed earlier, how good you were at that. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a, you had for the cycle in 1993. Yes. Did you think you were going to make that triple? Well. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, I was fortunate enough to, to lead the, nine, the decade of the 90s in his. I also had the most doubles in the 90s. And one of the biggest reasons for that is because I realized triples make you tired. <laughs> and so... After, once I, once I got to be a little older and a little wiser, I just, you know, if that ball went in the gap, the shoot got pulled right around first base, you know, there was not an aggressive turn towards third, uh, but on that particular day, uh, the triple was to left field, because I hit a ball and the left fielder went back. And there's a in, at Wrigley, there's that well in, in left and right field, it gets deeper. And the ball hit the bricks in that well area and shot straight to the, to the left field line. So he jumped for it, didn't come up with it, it hit the bricks, shot 90 feet away from him, and I was able to, to get a stand up triple, and I was tired. <laughs> So, so that was, that, yeah, a lot of people say, you know, I have a home run, but the, the triple was the, was the exciting part. <laughs> what did it take? I'll bet you you're going to ask Ted a question. <laughs> <laughs> what would it take or have you even been offered to do something like that? A position with the Cardinals since you're such a, a Cardinal legend. And yeah, well, you know. I've been lucky to have been employed throughout my lifetime with organizations that you know dear to me. Been with Atlanta now going five years, and um, today it's different in terms of the front office. Oh, right. I won't you know elaborate. Just to say, graybeards like myself tend not to get reemployed. Okay. Um, and it's the way it should be. We all, I mean, I'm trying to find a way out, not a way to stay in. Yeah. You see, so um, the likelihood of that happening is probably not very good um, because of my age. And that's the way it should be. Yeah. Like um, everything, baseball is getting younger. Right. So, yeah. I, 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 well, no, I'm just saying it's, it's the natural course of things. So, um, I'm good with that. You know, it'd be wonderful if Cardinals say, hey, Teddy, we bring you home and all that other happy stuff. Mm -hmm. It'd be great, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not required or necessary. And um, so, I'm, I'm good in Atlanta. They've been really good to me. I'm just being selfish. It'd be nice to see you more. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I see a lot of games. All right. Go ahead. Hey, uh, question for both of you. Both of your organizations have you know great rich history. What were some of the old timers that you really loved coming around to? You pick their brains. Well, I was um, the the Cubs did a good job of always bringing like the the. The ones from previous eras to like spring training and like m two of my coaches were one, my hitting coach for a while was Billy Williams oh, wow. and our pitching coach for a while was Ferguson Jenkins. So so you know there's nostalgia right there in the clubhouse every single day. And oh man, uh, do you know Billy very well? <laughs> not real well. Not real well. Okay, Billy Billy does not lack confidence. <laughs> Nor should he have. He was one of the greatest hitters of all time. But 
Billy was a great hitter, and he would and he loved to tell you how good a hitter he was. <laughs> and he would uh, he he'd be throwing BP batting practice for people. He'd be throwing batting practice, and there's a there's a screen in front of you when you're throwing batting practice, and sometimes a a ball will get lined right back up the box, and it would hit this screen, and the pitcher would jump. Jesus, you know, it almost got smoked. So Billy would say, Billy would say, man, that ball's coming back hard. I don't know how those pitchers felt when I was up there. <laughs> oh. and, it was, and it was funny. Or he'd tell you, he'd tell you, Gracie, Samper, man, see those bricks out there in that ivy? I used to hit the ball so hard off those bricks, I had to hook slide into second base. <laughs> And so, so, so Billy, uh, Billy was Billy. Was, I, I, I thank thank God for Billy every day. He taught me a lot. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that's all part of that's all part of the fun. Is you know now, kind of Ted and I are the nostalgia guys. Yeah, yeah. You know that uh, so yeah. so that torch has been passed to us yeah. to now to now for the for the young players, and I love it. I love talking about our era of baseball, and and they they look at you like, no way, <laughs> no way, you know, like like, really, you guys you guys were allowed to have hamburgers, <laughs> you know, just stuff like that. So so, so I, that's a fun part for me, Ted. Yeah. Well, you're right about the you know the, the people who come through the Cardinal organization. I mean, of course, Red. Of course, Stan. I was in the clubhouse. Red was the manager, and Stan would walk across the, you know, entry into Red's, you know, office, and he'd do it every day. And you'd walk, and you'd go, "Geez, that's that's you know, damn usual." And he'd walk back and forth, and you'd see him, and you just scratch your head. At it. I go back to when Ducky Medwick was actually alive, and Ducky Medwick from the old Gas House gang who had a great history, incredible history, okay, um, with shenanigans and great hitting and all kinds of crazy stuff in it. I think it was a, what, 34 World Series? Yeah. Just incredible, incredible, you know, history. And you had that everywhere. Yeah. These guys are floating around, you say, unusual, stucky mad way. And when you're young, I mean, it really does have an impact. And that's one of the great things about being around a Cardinal Blue organization. I mean, so, okay, after their period, Gibson, Brock, you know, all these people. I was in the clubhouse with Kurt Flood. I mean, you know, and you look back at this stuff and you say, oh, you've been a lucky boy to be around these types. And organizations like St. Louis just offer it up every day. Before long, there's going to be a whole other group. McGee, yeah. Yeah. Smith, mm -hmm. Smith's, you know, there now. But, you know, Coleman comes around. All these guys float in and out. And, and it's really special about an organization like that. Did, did you ever have Ernie Banks come around much? Oh, yeah. Ernie come around all the time. Yeah. Ernie never had a day, bad day in his life. He was the most upbeat guy I've ever, I've ever met in my life. Like, like... He might have been the best Cubs player ever. Well, also, you know, he'd be like, hey, you know, that's a beautiful day. Let's play two. <laughs> I said, well, Ernie, if I hit 515 bombs, I'm going to hit two plates every day. <laughs> <laughs> most, of us didn't, most of us didn't get that many. But thanks, uh, Mr. Cub. <laughs> but he was, he was, he was the most upbeat, great, happy guy. That I've, that I've ever been around. And that's, a, that's another guy that's missed every day. Yeah. Yeah. Is there somebody in the back that? Yes, sir. I know the next question. I just uh, want to thank you, two gentlemen, for bringing your talent to Major League Baseball so I can watch you make a pass on it. That's very kind of you, sir. Thank you.
right, as we do at the very end, we're gonna, each guy's going to sign a ball for somebody who's got draws. So I'm going to uh, mark Drew one, and his name is Floyd Montalino. Thank you. Thank you.